In this week's video, we'll cover ominous bear market signals similar to 2001 and 2008 forming on monthly charts. To view the video in full screen mode, use this icon in the lower right hand corner of your video player. To improve the clarity of the charts, use this icon in the lower right hand corner of your video player. In part one of the video, we'll be looking at daily and weekly charts. The main part of the video, part two, will be taking a longer term view, looking at monthly charts and bear market signals that have occurred in the past and compare them to the present day charts. We'll look at the model versus the major indices year to date in 2016 and scroll through a few oil charts that may be helpful in the days and weeks ahead. Since there's no magic moving average or time frame, regular viewers and clients know that the market model is highly diversified. We'll use these concepts on several charts, so I'll explain them once. If we understand extreme cases, bearish in 2008, a flip to bullish in 2009, we can better understand cases that fall in between. A full bore bearish look on a weekly chart is when price is below both moving averages, blue is below red and the slopes of both are down telling us that the probability of bad things happening is higher here than it was here. Conversely, a full bore bullish look is when price is above both moving averages, blue is above red and the slopes of both are up, telling us that the probability of good things happening is higher here than it was here. How does the exact same weekly chart look today? As of Friday, January 22nd at 2 p.m. Eastern time, Despite the rally, this is volatility to ignore, we still have a full bore bearish look. This looks more like this than it does this bullish period here in 2009. Similar concepts here, blue is still our fastest moving average. You can see we have blue below all of the moving averages and the slopes are all down here on July 22nd, 2008. The probability of bad things happening was higher and indeed bad things happened. The 2016 version of the same chart may answer some questions for clients. One question might be, why do we still have some exposure to stocks? Well, you can see here, blue is still above these moving averages. Another fair question might be, why did we tweet on Friday that the odds probably favored another conservative move next rather than adding to the growth side? This chart shows it as well. We don't have the cross yet but it's moving in the wrong direction. Even though the answers are yes, we easily could see them flip to no very, very soon. Also, the 2007 version of the chart helps us understand our emotions during a downtrend. A bottom is in, we get a counter trend rally. Now a bottom's in, counter trend rally, fully retraced. Boy, this is an impressive move for one or two days. Impressive rally, fully retraced within the context of the primary trend, which is down emotionally. Now it's the time to buy. We get a counter trend rally, fully retraced. The market is incredibly oversold here. Counter trend rally, fully retraced. Remember in a recent video, we said how long can it take to make up underperformance in a bear market? And we also said that when a trend started to emerge, most likely the model would start to add value. Here are the year-to-date returns for several major investments as of the close on January 21st. The average loss year-to-date is 10.21%. Now that a trend has started to emerge, the model is starting to add value. We looked at an account representative of the growth model on Thursday after the close. Instead of being down 10.21% year to date, it was down 4.3%. The model year to date, now that a trend is starting to emerge, is outperforming the market by 5.91%. Regardless, if this trend that we have now stays in place, this shows us that what we were expecting, that when the market started to trend in one direction or another, the model could start to leverage those trends 
We also said it was very possible to make up underperformance quickly once a trend emerged, and we're seeing that in real time early in 2016. Checking in our longer duration moving averages, you can see when the fastest moving average is on the bottom, the probability of bad things happening is higher. When the fastest moving average moves back to the top, the probability of good things happening is higher. Here are the same moving averages roughly a year ago. This is January 23rd of 2015. We've got a full bore bullish look. As of Friday, January 22nd, we clearly continue to have a full bore bearish look on the weekly chart of the S&P 500 index. Can we get a strong counter trend rally? Yes. Volatility to ignore, volatility to ignore, volatility to ignore primary trend. Earlier in the video, we showed you some charts that were still producing bullish or yes responses. Here's an example where the response is no. You can see this is the S&P 500 early in 2008. Blue is on the bottom. All of the slopes are down. The present day, blue is on the bottom. All of the slopes are down. This tells us that the market's current profile is unfavorable. Having lived through two horrible bear markets and countless corrections, I can tell you that the emotions that we're feeling as human beings in 2016 are basically identical to the emotions that we were feeling during this counter trend rally in late 2007 or this counter trend rally here in 2008. Counter trend rallies are common and they are typically by definition fully retraced when the primary trend remains down. When the primary trend flips in the other direction, this chart won't look like this or it won't look like this. It will morph into something that looks like this. Remember earlier we showed the worst four-day percentage loss to start a year on record, and that's dating back 118 years. Did large institutions step in and buy the dip after the first four trading days of the year? No, they did just the opposite. In fact, we had the worst 10-day start to the year in the history of the major U.S. market indexes. What exactly does that worst 10-day start mean? What it means is the net aggregate opinion of all market participants around the globe just produced the worst 10-day start to a new year in the history of the Dow and the S&P 500. That's a lot of research and a lot of thought and some very, very large hedge fund budgets that just produce the worst 10-day start to a year in history. This stat won't change anything that we do this year. However, it does make it much easier to respect the market's current profile, which is not favorable from a risk-reward perspective. You may counter with, Chris, we've had bad starts to the year before and stocks have finished in the green that is true, but you'll notice a lot of the stats that we're showing align with very, very difficult years. Now we're going to expand on the topics that we covered in last week's video. We're going to make the assumption that you watched last week's video. If you did not, you can Google this title to find it. In last week's video, we used the 50-day moving average and the 200-day moving average. Clients and regular viewers know that signals that occur on multiple time frames are more relevant. So if we're seeing similar things on daily, weekly, and monthly charts, our confidence increases. In this week's video, we'll use the same concepts from last week, but now we'll be looking at a monthly time frame, and then we'll compare the past to the signals that we're seeing form in the present day in early 2016. You remember from last week's video that we used the moving averages to help us discern between volatility to ignore, volatility to ignore, 
because the primary trend remains up and volatility to respect where we now have a clear bearish moving average crossover. It should be noted that no signal is perfect, including these monthly moving averages that we're showing here. You can see we get blue dropping below red here, so it's not perfect over this period, but you can see it's extremely helpful. Now, mathematically on this time frame, using this input on the model, we're into volatility to respect. Now, blue is below red, the slopes of both of them are down and price is below. This doesn't predict what's going to happen next, it just tells us that the probability of good things happening here is lower than it was really at any point between 1996 and October of 2000. After the bearish moving average crossover, our primary trend has flipped from up to down. Now, counter trend rallies are volatility to ignore. Blue stays below red. We never get a bullish moving average crossover between the year 2000 here and early 2003 here. Primary trend down, volatility to ignore. Then in early 2003, we go to volatility to respect. Now things are improving in a way that's starting to show something different on this chart from a risk reward perspective. Now price is above both moving averages. Blue is above red and the slopes of both are up. Notice fractals tell us that we can use the exact same concepts on a 60 minute chart, a daily chart, a weekly chart, and a monthly chart. From 2003 all the way into calendar year 2008, we have volatility to ignore, volatility to ignore, volatility to ignore, volatility to ignore, because the primary trend is up. Blue never drops below red on a closing basis on a monthly chart. And then in early 2008, the chart starts to look different and we flip to volatility to respect. Now price is below both moving averages. Blue is below red and the slopes of both are down and you can see white space in between the moving averages telling us that the probability of good things happening is lower here than it was at any time during this period here. Similar to this period here. This doesn't tell us anything about what will happen next. It just tells us about risk and reward. And then in this case, after the probabilities deteriorated, we did indeed flip over to a bearish trend. Now our primary trend is down. This is volatility to ignore here in calendar year 2008. And eventually on the monthly time frame in 2009, we get a bullish moving average crossover. And after this point, we're into a new primary trend, which in this case was up. In the next segment, we want to focus on these bearish moving average crossovers and tie them into the charts in early 2016. We went back and we moved through the monthly chart day by day to find the exact day where the crossover occurred. In this case, it was November 10th of 2000. And here it was January 2nd of 2008. Remember last week we said when we focus on shorter time frames only, things can be very, very difficult. So first we'll zoom into November 10th of the year 2000. When we focus on these shorter time frames, it gets more difficult. This looks harder, it's noisier, and we get into the day-to-day -day emotions and ego and balance swings. This is the day here, November 10th of 2000, where the chart of SPY or the S&P 500 ETF experienced the bearish moving average crossover that we just showed up here on the last chart. Here's the date. The S&P 500 closed at 1365. You can see here we have a support level, somewhat of a head and shoulders look. We've had a lot of sideways and frustrating action. And on the monthly chart, we get the bearish signal. What happened 
next. The first thing to note, almost immediately after this neckline was broken here, we had a counter trend rally telling us that the market never makes anything easy on any of us. And we can expect in 2016, no matter what the outcome, the market is not going to make it easy. Why is this volatility to ignore? Because during that counter trend rally here, the primary trend clearly is down, meaning that is volatility to ignore relative to the primary trend. Our bearish moving average crossover occurs here, telling us that the probability of bad things happening is now higher from this point right here. The S&P 500 lost an additional 43% relative to the day of the bearish moving average crossover it moved from 1365 on the day of the signal to 776 was the closing low when the bear market ended also as we've noted in past videos there's an opportunity cost component as well stocks are out of favor for an additional 698 calendar days from the day of the bearish moving average crossover that we showed to the end of the bear market. Now let's zoom into the second bearish moving average crossover that occurred on the monthly chart of SPY on January 2nd, 2008. When we get in tight, it gets awful noisy and awful confusing and very, very stressful as the market goes up and down on a daily basis. The day of the moving average crossover, the S&P 500 closed at 1447, which was January 2nd of 2008. We were still above support. Here, what happened next? After breaking below the neckline here, we had a sharp counter trend rally. The market doesn't make it easy on anyone the primary trend was still down we did not get a bullish moving average crossover on the monthly chart during this counter trend rally from the day of the bearish moving average crossover on the monthly chart that we just noted up here the s p 500 dropped from 1447 down to the intraday low on march 9th of 2009 of 66 six from an opportunity cost perspective why do we take these signals seriously when they show up on a chart in this case after the signal stocks were out of favor for 432 calendar days and they dropped an additional 54 percent from the day of the bearish moving average crossover on the monthly chart to the end of the bear market the next time we see a signal like this doesn't mean the market's going to drop 54 percent or 40 some odd percent absolutely positively no it simply speaks to the market's mathematical profile and trends and this applies to all markets the math and the moving averages roll over in every bear market in history the market doesn't care about the fundamental whys we either have an uptrend or a downtrend and the math works in very very similar ways in all bull markets in all bear markets now let's fast forward to 2015 2016 and look at the exact same monthly chart using the exact same monthly moving averages for s p y many of us will remember 2015 as the year of the whipsaw there was even a whipsaw on the monthly chart of SPY. Bearish moving average crossover. Bullish moving average crossover. And now we have another bearish moving average crossover. This point here is similar to November 10th of 2000 and January 2nd of 2008. As we noted in last week's video, it's not always this clean and easy. This period works well to illustrate basic concepts. 
This is the same monthly chart with the same moving averages. Now we're in 2011 where my cursor is, and this is the beginning of 2012. Does a bearish moving average crossover always lead to a bear market? Absolutely, positively, no. It speaks to probabilities. In this case, this is why we preach maximum flexibility. If you look at this and assume in advance that we're going to go into a bear market, you would have missed the observable improvement that occurred on this chart as well as daily and weekly charts. Here, the market's profile is unfavorable. Here, it improves, and after it improved, good things happened. That's why the model allocates based on facts in hand and why we always maintain that maximum flexibility. However, there are some significant differences between this period here and the present day. Now we're back to 2016 where my cursor is here. Let's highlight some of the other concerns on this chart in addition to a double bearish moving average crossover. If, and if should be emphasized, because this is a chart as of January 21st, if this lower low is in place at the end of the month, which may or may not be the case, then the three steps for a trend change will be in the books. Step one, we break a trend line. We did it here. Step two is we make a discernible lower high. We did it here. And step three for a trend change is a discernible lower low. Let's compare this to the chart in 2011 and 2012. This is 2011 where my cursor is. This is 2012, 2015 right here, 2016 here. Notice in the present day, we had a bearish moving average crossover and then a bullish moving average crossover. So this bullish moving average crossover that occurred as we were scaling in in 2015 looks very, very similar to this bullish moving average crossover that occurred after the low in 2011. We've shown in past videos there were a lot of similarities to this low that occurred in 2011 and this low that occurred in 2015. And then we had a follow through, including the bullish moving average crossover. The big difference here starts with this lower high. This is a discernible lower high relative to this high. Here, after we get the bullish moving average crossover, we make a discernible higher high that stays in line with the bullish moving average crossover and serves to confirm it, and we have an uptrend. Also note, after we get the bottoming process and the bullish moving average crossover, we never get anything even remotely close to another bearish moving average crossover. Look at all of the white space between these moving averages as stocks rally. That's indicative of a relatively strong trend. Compare this white space to this narrowing white space here, followed by a bearish moving average crossover. Not only do we have the lower high, we now are on track possibly to print a lower low. Could this chart here morph into something like this again? Absolutely, positively, yes. But we don't anticipate that. We know for a fact that this is an unfavorable risk-reward profile. Unfavorable means it can rally and good things could happen, but we need to see improvement before we put our capital in harm's way. Here's a quick summary of the signals that we've covered in this video. In 2001, after the signal occurred, stocks lost an additional 43% over the next 698 calendar days, 2008. Additional loss was 54% over 432 calendar days. Why we're taking this seriously in 2016? 
The same signal occurred on January 6, 2016. If we dropped 43% from the S&P 500's value on January 6th, the S&P 500 would bottom at 1134. A 54% drop from the close on January 6th would take us to 915. If it took us 698 calendar days to reach the low after the signal as it did in 2001, the S&P 500 would bottom on December 4th of 2017. If it takes 432 calendar days as it did in 2008, hypothetically the S&P 500 would bottom on March 13th, 2017. Notice this bear market dropped further than the first bear market shown, but it happened in fewer calendar days. Fool me once, fool me twice. If the next bear market sees a similar reduction and people run for the exits at a faster rate, a similar drop could occur in 267 calendar days. It's extremely important to note charts can improve. We could see a bullish moving average crossover. That's what occurred after the bearish signal in 2011, 2012. And this video is being recorded before January 31st, 2016. A monthly chart only prints one point a month. So we don't know what that point is until January 31st. If the market rallies back above 1990, then the bullish moving average crossover would be erased and it would not go into the history books. From the date of this recording, that would require about a 122 point gain on the S&P 500 before the end of the month. Remember in last week's video, we covered this study that showed us that predictions about what's going to happen in the future relative to the stock market, even by Wall Street experts, are about as valuable as a coin flip. Therefore, it's important to emphasize how we use this analysis. We need to maintain maximum flexibility because charts cannot predict the future. Charts assist us with assessing probabilities based on the knowns of the day, which means the charts that we've reviewed in this video help us understand the market's current risk-reward profile. 20-plus years of experience in the markets tells us that ugly charts and markets with ugly or unfavorable risk-reward profiles can begin to see improvement at any time. The charts looked terrible in late 2002, early 2003, and yet they improved. The charts and the market's risk-reward profile was unfavorable on March 8th of 2009, and yet we were one day away from dramatic improvement beginning even the monthly charts that we've covered in this video looked unfavorable in 2011. If we did not maintain maximum flexibility, we would not have been able to remain unbiased to see the improvement that began during these periods. Improvement can begin in 2016 at any time. We don't anticipate it. We need to see it. Under our system and under our approach and based upon experience, it's a big mistake to think we know what is going to happen next. And that includes what's going to happen for the remainder of 2016. We use the terms probability and risk reward for a reason because they imply that the lower probability outcome is possible. If there's a 90% chance we're going to go into a bear market, then there's a 10% chance that we will recover and not enter a bear market. Therefore, maximum flexibility is always required. The market model follows numerous investment buckets, including oil, as the charts that follow show we'll be watching oil a little bit more closely between 22 and 30 dollars a barrel. 
Those of you that follow along on Twitter know that sometimes something as simple as a parallel trend channel can be very, very powerful from a support and resistance perspective. Oil, daily, we're not predicting anything. We're just saying if oil comes down to 23 or $24 a barrel, looking at a daily chart using closing prices, we will be paying a little bit closer attention down here. Doesn't mean we're going to bounce. It just means it's worth watching a little bit more closely. It's possible that we could blow right through this trend line because all support is possible support. The market decides which chart is important. We do not make that decision. Therefore, we improve our probabilities of success if we also draw lines using high, low close on a daily chart. In that case, we'll be watching a little bit more closely if oil gets down to 22 or $23 a barrel. When we were at the top of the channel, we moved to the bottom of the channel. We're at the bottom, we moved to the top. If we move back to the bottom of the channel using weekly closing prices, we would pay attention if oil gets down to $25 or $26 a barrel. Same concepts, weekly high-low close, 22 to 23 Monthly oil, high-low close, paints a similar picture. And we might look at this monthly chart as of January 21st and say oil has bottom. But remember, this is a monthly chart. It won't print this level here. It will print the level at the end of the month. So if this trend line were relevant, oil might close out this month around $29 a barrel. It's also possible that it would stop at this trend line at the end of next month. Anything is possible. These trend channels are worth watching. All support is possible support, meaning price could blow right through it. If we understand the market's current risk reward profile using hard data, when it begins to change, we can monitor that data and adjust rather than anticipating and hoping. How do we track all of this and convert it into a usable and actionable format in a reasonable amount of time? The sub-models, we answer binary questions, some of them manually done, some of them programmed in Excel, and we also enter in unbiased and hard data. The submodels allow us to get a handle on the market's current profile, and the master CCM market model then looks at the current profile, compares it to past profiles, and recommends a prudent allocation between risk assets such as stocks and conservative assets such as bonds. Conservative assets can consist of cash, bonds, currencies, or any number of investment options. If you'd like to learn more about the market model or our money management services, you can visit our website, follow along on Twitter, Facebook, read our blog, short takes, or watch past videos on the Shivako Capital channel on YouTube. The material in this video has no regard to the specific investment objectives, financial situation, or particular needs of any viewer. This video is presented solely for informational purposes and is not to be construed as a solicitation or offer to buy or sell any security or any related financial instruments, nor should any of the content be taken as investment advice. Any opinions expressed in this video are subject to change without notice, and Shivako Capital Management, LLC, or CCM, is not under any obligation to update or keep current the information contained herein. CCM and its respective officers and associates or clients may have an interest in the securities or derivatives of any entities referred to in this material. CCM accepts no liability whatsoever for any loss or damage of any kind arising out of the use of all or any part of this material. We recommend that you consult with a licensed and qualified professional before making any investment decision.